Thank you, Sid. I appreciate the, the invitation to speak here tonight. It's a great honour to be here as Chief of the Defence Force, and I apologise to those that uh, had to rearrange their schedule because I wasn't able to make the previous uh, commitment. I think complex, though, is an uh, understatement at the moment, and uh, what I aim to do this, this evening is be able to go through what the, the, uh, the Defence Force is doing at the moment and then look to the, the future and how what we're doing now is actually setting the scene for tomorrow. Now, we're a Defence Force that's undergone significant modernisation and learning over the past 15 years of very high operational tempo. A Defence Force that is highly capable independently, yet also interoperable with the United States and a range of like-minded partners, both regionally and globally. Our ability to operate effectively with partners in, our diver in a diverse range of theatres from Timor-Leste and the Solomon Islands to Pakistan, Afghanistan and Iraq is a standout achievement in our recent and current operations. And at the same time, we're also in a period of significant cultural reform. However, if you told me that during my first four and a half months as CDF, we would have Australian Defence Force personnel on the ground in the Ukraine, be conducting airstrikes and deployed a special operations task group back into Iraq, still searching for a missing civilian aircraft in a remote expanse of the southern Indian Ocean almost 2,000 kilometres off the West Australian coast, or monitoring a Russian naval deployment transiting international waters to the north of Australia, I would have scoffed at the suggestion. In fact, even two out of those I would have scoffed at. When I assumed the command of the ADF on the 1st of July, our operational priority was Australia's ongoing role in Afghanistan. In particular, the 400 ADF personnel deployed in Kandahar and Kabul to train and advise the Afghan security forces under Operation Slipper. We had started to consider our advice to the government regarding Operation High Road, Australia's enduring contribution to Afghanistan beyond the current ISAF mission. And we had allowed ourselves to begin thinking about the ADF's reposture following a decade of high operational tempo and multiple overseas deployments. That changed on the 17th of July this year, when MH17 was shot down over the Ukraine, murdering 298 people, 38 of them being Australian citizens and residents. In the days immediately following the crash, the ADF was called to support Operation Bring Them Home, Australia's whole of government response to the disaster. Our role was primarily to support the Australian Federal Police in a Dutch-led, police-led operation. Two Royal Australian Air Force C-17 aircraft were deployed as a part of our contribution. In fact, one of those aircraft was on its way home after a seven-week deployment to the Middle East. They got as far as Diego Garcia, then turned around and went back uh, into Europe. And if you want to hear a good story, Jeff will tell you a good story about one of his young LACs that was on that flight, who was disappointed he couldn't get home and then uh, quite, uh, quite excited at the fact of what they could do to contribute to this operation, uh, being away another five weeks. However, it wasn't all beer and Skittles. We saw those sombre images of the Australian aircraft on the, tar the tarmac at Eindhoven as the procession of hearses slowly made their way out of the base. But what you didn't see were the aircrew and ground crew who worked around the clock, loading caskets into the aircraft themselves before transporting the victims from the Ukraine to the Netherlands for formal identification, and then later returning many of the victims home to their family and loved ones back here in Australia. Behind the scenes, the mission required extensive planning and cooperation across multiple nations, other government agencies, and many time zones. Defence staff in the United States, Europe and Australia worked long hours to successfully ensure Australian personnel and equipment moved rapidly into Europe and then forward into the Ukraine. Additional RAAF aircrew and aircraft flew support missions between Australia and the Netherlands, while headquarters staff, logisticians, planners, medical specialists, security personnel and other enabling staff in Australia and the Netherlands ensured that those in the Ukraine had the resources and backup required to carry out this difficult task in a complex and very dangerous security environment. And the current link between the ADF and the Royal Netherlands Defence Force dates back to 2006, when we united again in Aruzgan. That relationship was strengthened as a result of this deployment while a new association formed with our Ukrainian counterparts. For me personally, the shoot-down of MH17 highlights three critical points that have set the scene for the tenure of my command. The unpredictable nature of the global security environment, the complex or the complexity of international interagency operations, 
and that the ADF has demonstrated the ability to deploy to the other side of the world at very short notice. It also demonstrates how much the security environment has changed. Also, increasing global globalisation and connectivity has seen Australia's reach and influence grow beyond what has been familiar to all of us in the past. The strategic environment has grown in complexity as increasing economic prosperity fuels the quest for greater military capability from nations that seek to exert power and authority through to extremist groups that seek the same. Terrorism, territorial disputes and challenges to sovereignty will continue to demand our attention, but the form and nature of, the, of these threats is growing harder to predict. Globalisation is allowing extremist groups access to skills, technology and resources that were once difficult for all but state actors to obtain. And consequently, countering terrorism internationally and domestically is one of the most significant challenges facing security, security agencies around the world. Providing insurance against these and other unforeseen challenges that could emerge in the future is one of the ADF's primary functions. In this environment, I see the ADF as a potent and agile force at the forefront of protecting Australia's security and prosperity. And we work closely with the nation's other security agencies to shape the envir environment so that we can never have to call on that insurance policy in the future. However, as we are seeing, the task of defending Australia and our national interests does not begin and end at our borders. In fact, gone are the days where we focus just on defending the air sea gap to our north. Today, the interdependence of our nation's security and prosperity with developers around the world mean that the ADF must be thinking and acting regionally and globally as our core business, 24-7. Last month, I met with military leaders from 21 other nations in Washington to discuss the coalition's fight against ISIL terrorists. Although ISIL has had significant initial success, the coalition is gaining strategic momentum and partner, nation, partner nations will continue to build on our successes to date. We know ISIL is an adaptive enemy. We're seeing that every day. But we've demonstrated that the coalition has the agility and the ability as partners to come together to provide the capabilities required to disrupt and degrade their attack. ISIL has fought to occupy urban centres and relied on road vehicle movement like any conventional force would. In the absence of any air power threat, the insurgents were able to advance quite rapidly, but the introduction of a multinational strike campaign has, as we predicted, restricted their movement and required them to substantially adapt their tactics. The unity manifested in the coalition to date illustrates our collective resolve to neutralise the ISIL threat and to provide political, economic, humanitarian and military support to the people of Iraq. However, I must stress, stability, returning stability to Iraq will take time and rebuilding their security forces will require a sustained investment from the international community. Now, while we must always remain focused on our current operations, we're also at a critical juncture in setting the direction of our defence strategy. This strategy will, will also include bringing together our capabilities and our resources required in the future. In this respect, the 2015 Defence White Paper will define the shape and capability of the ADF into the second half of this century and provide a coherent, fully integrated plan for Australia's long-term defence that aligns national interests, strategy, capability, organisation and resources. One of the most important outcomes from the White Paper will be a long-term, affordable plan to build defence's capabilities to meet government's strategic aims. This is essential to un underpin a strong and sustainable planning basis for the current and the future ADF. However, while delivering the White Paper is very important, our success in maintaining the strategy capability, organisation and resource alignment over time will be a key test for government, defence and the ADF. Being a strategy-led organisation is critical for us to manage the range of challenges facing us in the future and is requiring us to think differently about some of our decision-making processes. As you're aware, there are also two associated reviews currently underway which will support the white paper process. In addition to reviewing our short and long-term strategic environment, the first principles review of defence will provide a perspective on how we can better achieve and sustain this alignment. And additionally, we're undertaking a force structure review to determine what capabilities defence requires to meet those challenges and examining our readiness and sustainability requirements. 
With these elements combined, the white paper process is critical to determining Australia's defence future. Ultimately, though, the 2015 Defence White Paper and its decisions are a matter for government. We are acutely aware that government expects the White Paper to be founded on a very sound costing basis that gives the Commonwealth confidence that the investment in defence is sustainable and efficient. In order to do this, we are examining the basis for defence's cost estimations of our current and potential future capability choices. In addition, to support the Department's development of the White Paper, the Minister appointed an expert panel provide independent external advice to the Minister. And we're working closely with that panel and meet them regularly across the, the Department to discuss relevant issues and gain their input. However, the White Paper doesn't come with a blank cheque. As CDF, I'm cognisant that we must be responsible and accountable with the taxpayers' money and provide a realistic, affordable plan that meets our objectives. The Australian public must be assured that their investment in the ADF is both effective and value for money, and be confident that Australia will maintain an ADF that can continue to assure our nation's security into the future. We must build on our core strengths while introducing new and better capabilities in the joint area, in particular those areas that will be central to success in information and decision superiority in the future. And we must do this while maintaining the integrity of the balanced, integrated and joint force that's currently at the heart of the ADF and that's providing us great flexibility to move quickly across the spectrum of military operations. In the future, I expect us to be a force that has intelligence, surveillance, infrastructure, ICT, logistics, command and control, and other important enablers in place to make the force work when, where, and how we need. And I can confidently speak for the Defence Leadership Group in saying that we understand very clearly the need to ensure that enablers are front and centre in the decision about future force and future funding priorities. Historically, Australia has always been an outward-looking state with regional priorities and global interests. But where we have previously made the geographic distinction between those interests close to home and those in the broader region, particularly South East and North Asia, the evolving security environment means we now must also look much further afield. In the interest of promoting global stability, the ADF has deployed to conflicts and humanitarian and disaster relief operations far from our shores. And this was the impetus behind the Australian Government's initial decision to employ Australian forces in northern Iraq in mid-August to conduct humanitarian airdrops to assist the thousands of Yazidi civilians who were driven from their homes and became trapped on Mount Sinjar. In this case, we delivered much needed bottled water, high energy biscuits, hygiene packs, blankets directly to those in need. And this, was this was successful despite the threat that ISIL posed to our aircraft and our aircrew. The follow-on Iraq deployment demonstrates just how far the ADF has, has come in the 21st century. We have learned a great deal, both strategically and tactically. Not just from those high-profile operations in the Middle East region that we've previously been in, but also on long-term deployments in our own backyard in Timor-Leste and the Solomon Islands and extremely short notice deployments such as Pakistan Assist 2, Operation Pacific Assist, and most recently Operation Philippines Assist in late 2013. All operations that were multi-agency operations and multinational. Strategically, strong international engagement by our defence force is a significant asset, and the future stability and security of our region will depend on our ability to continue to operate transparently and cooperatively, cooperatively with our neighbours. Tactically, working alongside our coalition allies as a member of the International Security Assistance Force in Afghanistan for the past decade has set a new bench benchmark for interoperability. Importantly here is our alliance with the United States, which affords us access to intelligence capability and high-end technology that boosts our combat power and therefore our overall capability. Over time, our doctrine, communication, equipment and systems have evolved to new levels of international compatibility. That said, the ADF is more self-sufficient on operations now than we have been at any time in our past. We are no longer fitted for, but not with, those critical capabilities. Today, we are fitted both for and with the equipment we need to deploy rapidly to conduct humanitarian and disaster relief operations or respond to high-end security threats. Our people are well trained, well equipped and well positioned to make a meaningful contribution. 
This is true across the entire organisation. But if you allow me, as an old uh, fighter pilot, give me some indulgence, I'll take you through some of the, the issues running with the Air Task Group at the moment. While relatively small in size overall, the combination of strike aircraft, tankers, and airborne early warning control aircraft mean that the current Air Task Group currently deployed to OCRA, Operation OCRA, in Iraq is not only one of the most capable air packages Australia has ever deployed, it's also probably the first completely organic or self-contained air task group we have ever deployed. The E-7 Airborne Early Warning Control aircraft, more commonly known as the Wedgetail, is providing critical intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance capability. It's performing two main functions. First is to deconflict and control the tactical battle space by providing direction to the coalition aircraft. Second, it's to, is it its ability to gather information from a wide range of sources which can be analysed and communicated to air and surface assets. In doing this task, the wedge tail is proving to be a significant capability multiplier that increases the coalition's overall effectiveness. In fact, it's an asset that's requested by choice by the Air Component Commander for some missions. Maureen, pretty impressive for an aeroplane that was on a project of concern for such a long time. But it shows why you need to persevere with some of these high-end capabilities because they give you the capability in the long run that you need. Of course, most of the media reporting has been around the activities being conducted by our Super Hornets, and this is not a Boeing promo, by the way. Our multi-role fighter, the Super Hornet, has the ability to do advanced air combat, air-to-air, air-to-ground missions, and can undertake interception, close air support, and interdiction of any su enemy supply lines on a single mission. Now, each Super Hornet at the moment is flying about eight to 10 hour mission lengths, which is, if you've never sat in an ejection seat for eight to 10 hours, you should try it. And each aircraft may refuel for up to four times during a single mission, which brings me to the final element of the package, the all important KC-30 multi-role tanker, which is providing refuelling capability not only to the Australian task force, but to other coalition aircraft, including French Rafale, Canadian Hornets, US AV-8B and Hornet aircraft. I think at last count, it's about two and a half million pounds of fuel transferred. Looking at Chief of Air Force, who gets the latest stat. That's pretty impressive for a single aeroplane that's been deployed for about six weeks. Now, Operation Ocker is a significant deployment for the Australian Defence Force. Our ability to prepare and deploy the Air Task Group and Special Forces contingent in less than two weeks was a substantial achievement by any military standards. The ADF's joint warfighting war capability is evolving and the forces we can bring to government to address any contingency reflect this. The ADF possesses a significant capability set that we do need to maintain, as well as others that we're preparing to bring into service. Those include the new amphibious ships, Canberra and, and uh, Adelaide, and also the F-35s being introduced at the end of this decade. Now, both these capabilities will be game changers again in our ability to operate to the highest levels of capability. Generating military capabilities is complex, it's specialised and it's expensive work. It's important to maintain at least some capabilities to meet high-end threats in order to deter our adversaries and maintain our credibility among the world's militaries. And we are seeing growing military capabilities in our own region, which does not necessarily increase the risk of major conventional attack against Australia, but it does mean we need to carefully consider a strategy that balances the risks and the opportunities. As a consequence, we must strengthen our core warfighting capabilities as a foundation for our ability to undertake a full range of roles and other military tasks the ADF must be able to achieve. Wherever the ADF deploys over the next 20 years, we will likely face a more dangerous operating environment. We must be flexible enough and capable enough to respond when government asks us to do, it so, to do so wherever Australia's national interests are engaged across the world. But we must also employ an appropriate posture in our region to help minimise the risk that we will need to employ the ADF in a conflict in the future, while maximising our ability to effectively work with a range of partners to meet our common security challenges. As I've alluded a number of times tonight, we share regional and global interests with many others. And therefore, we have to focus on building defence partnerships and international capacity to address these common security challenges. Military and broader defence engagement and presence in our region is more important than ever. We cannot afford to take our relationships for granted. In the past five months alone, each of the services has conducted important regional engagement. One of the most significant exercises was recently staged in the Northern Territory. 
Exercise Kawari was the first trilateral exercise involving, involving Australia, China and the United States. This land-based survival training marked an important milestone in defence's cooperation between the three nations and demonstrated a commitment to enhancing mutual trust, cooperation and regional security. And the Australian Army did a fantastic job in bringing that together and it's been one of the highlights of this year. For three weeks in August, Air Force hosted 110 aircraft and 2,300 personnel from the United States, Singapore, Thailand, the United Arab Emirates, New Zealand and France for exercise Pitch Black 2014. Held every two years, Pitch Black is our premier and most complex air exercise. And this year it was followed by the Royal Navy, Royal Australian Navy's largest maritime warfare exercise known as Exercise Kakadu. Over two weeks for Kakadu, there were more than 1,200 Navy personnel, eight warships and 26 aircraft from 15 coalition forces throughout the Asia Pacific and the Indian Ocean regions that conducted tactical warfare planning as well as high-end warfare serials. And last week, we concluded Operation Render Safe in Bougainville. And I cannot overstate the significance of the work our personnel have undertaken over the past four weeks in Bougainville. Our explosive ordnance disposal technicians have found and destroyed more than 2,000 World War II bombs and items that were left in the Pacific, over 16 tonnes of unexploded ordnance. Now this is important work and, and reduces the threat to the local populations as well as now opening up more land for agricultural use. Back home, hasn't been quiet either. Australia hosted around 1,500 US Marines over the six months to October on a rotational deployment to ADF facilities in Darwin. Now those rotations have become part of the use, business as usual for Australia and provide increased opportunities for Australia and the United States forces to train together and also deepen defence relations with regional countries. And back up at Exercise Kawari was a good example of that. To our north, the recent decision by the Japanese government to adjust its constitutional interpretation to allow Japanese self-defence forces to play a more active role in the region's security is also welcome. This change to Japan's policy settings will also allow for deeper defence relations between Australia and Japan. Importantly, it'll include more sophisticated exercise engagement between our both, both our forces. Defence's programs, activities, presence, including through our in-country defence and maritime surveillance and advisors across the South Pacific and operations across the Indo-Pacific are also critical to strong, capable and an interoperable ADF and a sustainable security in our region. They're about building shared understanding and international capacity to address common challenges. And the returns we gain for Australia's security from these investments far outweighs the cost. And I was lucky enough on Monday to be able to talk to our new group of advisers that are heading out to the, the South Pacific and get a chance to talk to them and, and tell them how important the job that they're about to do is in, the, in that regional engagement. And finally, we should not understate the criticality of our long-standing defence relationships in the Middle East, particularly in facilitating our ability to quickly deploy and quickly and effectively deploy into that region. I can confidently say that we would not have been able to deploy an Operation Okra without the trust and goodwill that has been built up over many years. And this brings home the point again that coalitions are far more about boots on the ground and in the future we must take that strategic approach to our defence relationships and presence in key regions. In fact, coalitions are all about relationships and they don't come overnight, you build them over many, many years. While the ADF has demonstrated its strengths as an arm of Australia's national power over recent months, our security environment will remain susceptible to rapid change. The ADF must be ahead of the curve if we are to continue to provide the military capability to support Australia's aspirations for its security and prosperity, both today and over the coming decades. In closing, in closing ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to draw on the statement I made to the ADF when I assumed command before I knew a lot of this was about to happen. My intent is for a defence force assured of success at all levels of operations, from humanitarian and disaster response through to high-end war fighting. A joint force that can control the air, maritime and land domains, along with the associated cyberspace in an operation. A joint force that fully understands and uses our enablers to the best effect, including space, intelligence, electronic warfare, acquisition, logistics, IT systems, and most importantly, how we prepare our people. 
My priority over the next four years is to successfully transform the ADF into the next generation force in accordance with the strategic direction of the upcoming White Paper. We must learn from the successes and the failures of our past to ensure that we transition as a capable and professional force that is trusted and respected by all Australians and the region. In fact, Australians expect and deserve no less. Thank you. Now, I know I'm standing between you and dinner, but uh, I think we've got time for a, for a few questions. Stu? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, could I ask you to identify yourselves as uh, you ask the city of questions? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, I'm at G'day CDF. You surprised me, Dave. I thought you'd be <laughs> Here <fine>. I am. <laughs> Predictable as always. Uh, David Rowe from The Age and Sydney Morning Herald. I'm usually disciplined in asking just one question, but as you uh, referred to at the start of your speech, there are so many damned issues at the moment that I mm. hope you'll permit me to. Um, uh, firstly, uh, why has Russia sent four warships uh, mm -hmm. towards Australia while the G20 is on? Usually when there's been an international uh, event like this, they have in the past sent one or two. This time it's four. That seems to be an escalation. Could you explain Defence's thinking on that? Um, secondly, what is the level of coordination, direct or indirect, between the countries that are carrying out the air campaign in Iraq, including Australia, yeah. and the Iranian military, which is helping the Iraqis on the ground? It just seems impossible to believe that there isn't some coordination between the air campaign and what's happening on the ground. I, could, I wonder if you could explain the mechanism for that and Australia's role, if any, in it. Thank you. Yeah, so the, how the air campaign is coordinated is through the Combined Air and Space Operations Centre. So all tasking will, will come into that, as will deconfliction out of the Joint Operations Centre in Baghdad. So from, uh, from our side of it, that deconfliction is coordinated through Baghdad, where you've got Iraqi and, uh, and US forces doing that. How Iraq coordinates with, uh, with other nations that, that might be there, I'm not uh, privy to that. But it is deconflicted uh, across the board. As for the, uh, the Russian ships, they're currently uh, in the Coral Sea at the moment. The, uh, as you said, they've, they've done it before. Uh, this time around, they have actually publicised their intent. They've, uh, they've had it out there for a little while that they were deploying a task force to the South Pacific. Uh, their confidence, one of them's an ocean-going tug. So uh, you know, that's one of the, the, the four ships that they might not normally have had before, and the other is, a, is an oiler. So um, it, it's, it's just one of, a part of their, uh, their operation. They're in international waters, they're allowed to, to do that. And we, but they're in our approaches. We'll continue to surveil them with air and uh, maritime assets. You'd have to ask the Russians. Neil James from the Australia Defence Association. Um, I was struck when you were talking, Mark, by um, your references to the increases in strategic mobility and the ability of the ADF to uh, sustain itself both in Australia and, and, and on uh, far-flung uh, deployments. Um, with the white paper process uh, proceeding as it is, um, is it possible that really for the first time since World War II, we're not only fitted for but not with um, in terms of, uh, of capability, but we're also fitted for but not with in terms of strategic imagination, in that we can now offer governments a full range of options um, uh, for crises that we certainly couldn't do um, in the 1970s, 80s and 90s when strategic policy looked, uh, looked more inwards? I, I think that's a... I think it was a question. It could have been a statement too. You know, but I, I think you're right. I think if you look at it now, any, anything that happens that we think, from a CDF point of view, that, a, that is a part of Australia's national interest, the first thing I look for is I'll talk to Chief of Air Force and ask where the C-17s are. Because... The C-17 and the KC-30 that gives us the, the, the ability to respond quite quickly. And if government wants to respond quickly to, a, uh, to a, an emerging threat or a, a humanitarian assistance or something like that, the government can make a decision and we can be there quite quickly. Whereas before when we were a C-130 world, uh, it, everything took longer to get there. But the C-17 and the KC-30 means that we can react and we can have an Australian presence and start to represent Australia's interests quite quickly uh, anywhere the government might want to want to put us. So you are seeing that. In the, in the air task group deployment, uh, if that had been five years ago, when government made that decision, we would have had to have gone to the US or contracted tankers, and we would have been looking for air support 
uh, trying to contract Antonovs and that to, to go in. In this particular case, we didn't need that. We actually, I think, we contracted one Antonov towards the end for a, for a few vehicles, but that was about it. The rest of it was, uh, was done organically within the, the ADF's resources. That's pretty impressive. Uh, people now that fly C-17s get used to carrying their passports, even if they're flying around Australia, because if they're away, away from Ambly, there's no guarantee they're going to head back there tonight. They might end up in uh, Japan or the Ukraine or, uh, or, or wherever. Um, and for some, or for many of them, that's making life a lot, quite exciting. They're actually quite enjoying it. They're, they're, uh, they're, getting, they're working hard, but they're delivering, and they're pretty proud of it. I think you'll see the same when the new amphibious ships come on board as well. It takes longer to go places, but you're going to see Australia's interest represented more around the, the region than what we've currently been doing. Hey, Nick. Sorry, Nick, just <laughs> crowded you out. Um, James Brown from nice Lowe's. Nice Nick. <laughs> James Brown from Lowe Institute. Thank you to ASPE for the mm -hmm. opportunity tonight and thank yep. you to you for all the work you've done over the last couple of months. How do, can you help those of us who are outside uh, government and defence mm -hmm. think about the limits to Australian power? So we've seen yeah. a period in which, uh, in, early in your command, early in the government, there's been a lot of simultaneous crises to think about. Mm -hmm. How can we think about where the upper limits to Australia, uh, to Australian deployments are and what we can do? Is it a question of simultaneity? Is it a question of just mathematics and resources? How do you sort of provide advice on that? So concurrency is an issue that I watch day in and day out. We've been we're able to manage what we've been doing at the moment because there's been different assets against each of the, the tasks. So that's, that's helped us. I do watch the special forces uh, because they are one of the first ports of points of call on uh, many operations. So we work, we look at those closely and our air lift capability there, the, the two, two areas. Um, but the others, we just manage it. So if there's a, there's a, a uh, issue that comes up, a crisis, a, uh, an option that we need to present to government, then I present that to government, but I present it with what the concurrency issues or the limitations may be, if there are any. Uh, with G20 coming up at the moment, uh, we're almost 5,000 people on operations. So that's, that's a high point for, for a long time. Uh, and and that's, a, that's 5,000 people on a diverse number of operations. Now, don't quote me on the maths, because I'm, some of them might be dual, dual assigned, but it's, there's, before the G20 came up, there'd be 3,000 on operations every day. Uh, so you know, it's, a, it's a fairly substantial commitment that we make. But through the systems that we put in place over the last few years, where I can understand the preparedness a lot better and be able to articulate that better, we're in a better position to understand what the risks are and, and make sure that we're managing them the best we can. Yeah. Nick, uh, very much a follow-up question to James. Uh, I was just wondering, to what extent do you think we... Where, uh, what, what extent are we trying to find military answers to problems, particularly in the Middle East, that are actually political? To, yeah. to what extent are you being forced to actually try and uh, solve an, an issue that isn't yours to solve? No, there's, there's no doubt that uh, the military is the first response uh, often, but the fact is most of the, most of the, the, the final solutions are outside the military's uh, purview. We can stabilise and we can help set the conditions, but ultimately, and you'll see that in Iraq and the Middle East at the moment, that's political, diplomatic. Uh, that's a key part of that. It's counter ideology. And both those require the, the more nearer regions to, uh, to Iraq and Syria to be able to bring that together. And the, the, you're starting to see more work on that. That's more difficult to bring the coalition together uh, to, to do, but it, it's, it's got to be the, the primary uh, task, I think, of all this in the long term. How do you set the conditions so that what was there that allowed this to happen in the first place isn't there in the future. So as the military campaign starts to, to, to build up, as the, the Iraqi security forces start to get the wherewithal to do it, that they'll push ISIL out, destroy, but how do you set the conditions so that that's, though, so it's not going to happen again? And that, that's really a part of that political diplomatic side of it. And people are acutely aware of that. There's a, there is a lot of discussion going on around that. So when we sit around, uh, uh, talk about this with government and options, it's not just the military side that gets discussed. Uh, that's what you see, but that's not, uh, that's not all that's being discussed. Yeah. John? Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, CDF. Uh, 
excellent overview. Um, you talked about relationships and the significance of relationships for our ability to conduct operations, to reach out and engage and do our jobs efficiently and effectively. Um, my sense is that we're dropping the ball in, in our ability to do that effectively in Southeast Asia. My sense is the ADF is much more comfortable, much more familiar with the sandpit than it is with their own neighbourhood and the op-tempo is sort of driving us further down that path. Um, I wonder if you can comment on that, but also just you mentioned, talk, talked about the LHDs in passing. Mm -hmm. My sense is that they offer a really significant opportunity for us to engage regionally, collaboratively with our neighbours in a really constructive, helpful mm -hmm. Way. I wonder if you can just elaborate on that too, please. I'll start with the second one first. I agree 100%. So the LHD is an amphibious ship. People will think uh, it's, uh, it's more having combat troops on it all the time. In fact, I see it the other way. I, I see it being out regionally uh, and it doesn't have to come back to Australia to, to change the force over. It can be out there with the equipment that it might need for medical, civil engineering tasks, uh, training with, uh, with other nations and we can actually fly fly the people in and out again without bringing the, sh the ship back if we if we plan its deployments properly. So I see that as being a, a, a not a game changer in the region, but it gives us the ability to be out and about far more and have far more influence. Um, I think it's a misnomer to say we're not focusing on the, the, the region. The engagement with uh, the closer countries is still quite strong. In fact, probably there's probably more going on regionally now than there was about a, a year ago. I get updates every, every week and there's a lot going on. There's a lot of small deployments that go in and out of PNG. Uh, our relationship with Indonesia has started to, to, to come back up uh, again. Um, the, the same FPDA exercises still run in Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, we still send uh, aircraft and, uh, and ground forces to, to those. We've had the patrol boat, which was Larakia, do a uh, stop through Vietnam, round through the Philippines and around in the last uh, month or so. We still have uh, engagement further north into to North Asia uh, as well. So there's a lot there. Unfortunately, it's good news. It doesn't get picked up. The media releases go out, but uh, people tend not to pick up on it that much and, uh, and report it. So there, there is a lot going on. I'd be happy to, to take you at some stage and, and take you through it all if you'd, you'd like. Yeah. But there's no doubt that uh, you know, it... it by keeping all the focus that we are globally at the moment, it is a hard task, but, it, but we're managing it as, as well as we can. And I've, I haven't seen us come back uh, out of the region as much as you would, would think for what's going on in the Middle East. Yeah. Oh. Thanks, sir. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.